Amen. Well, hello. God bless everybody, sisters and girls, for coming on tonight. We're going to continue talking about Christology, girls, which is the study of Christ's person in his role. And tonight we're going to be talking about how he is Lord. And this is a very big topic. All the topics of Christology are very important, and we should always acknowledge because if we claim that he is our Savior, guys, our high priest, our meteor, and so on, but if we don't know what it means or how it works, then our belief is merely just something we just heard from someone with no understanding. And we will truly not appreciate him, guys, in his work. So it would not be a real confession or a relation. So as Christians, followers of Christ, how can we follow him and be conformed to him if we don't truly know his ways or him? In the Bible it says, his sheep desire and follow him. So as true born again believers, this should be our desire to know Christ. Amen. So tonight we're talking about Jesus as Lord. Mostly everyone I know, even our children, will say that Jesus is Lord. We say it in our prayers, we say it to people as we talk about him to each other. It has automatically come out as we're praying. Am I right? But do we really know what we are confessing and what it means that Jesus is Lord? So before we talk about his lordship, I want to talk about what does this word mean. Now, if you go on our YouTube, we have a YouTube. Uh, our sister in Christ, Candy, she did a, a word study on the word Lord. And she did a great job, all glory to God. But we're going to go over it since we're talking about Jesus' word. So let's begin. Amen? Now, in the Bible, the Lord is used over 7,000 times in the Bible. But it depends on what translation which you guys are reading from. But you will see sometimes in the word Lord different types. Um, like one with a capital L or one with a lowercase l. And sometimes Lord in all capital letters. And this is very important because there's different meanings to them. And I'm going to try to explain it quickly. So when you see the word Lord in all capitals, it's replying to God in his personal name, which is Yahweh. This is what uh, God had told Moses in, the, in Exodus 3, the story of Moses and the burning bush, which God had used to, to appear to Moses. To go, he said, to go and free the Israelites, Moses says, what name shall I give them if they ask what God you are? And I'm just paraphrasing, guys. Uh, God says, Yahweh, which means he will be, and he is, which means God always was, and he was always there. So there's, uh, so his name is Yahweh, which means he will be. He's the Alpha and the Omega, and he's self-sufficient. So when you see all the capital, uh, capital letters for Lord, like capital L, capital O, capital O-R-D, it really means Yahweh. Amen? And now when you see the word Lord with just one capital L and a little O-R-D, uh, it's referring to Adonai, which is used to describe as the one who is absolutely sovereign. And it's a title mostly referred to for God. You see it in many scriptures, both Lord with capital all caps and Lord with just the capital L. How it refers to God the Father. In Psalms 8 9, it reads, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. In Isaiah 10 33, uh, it, sta it starts off like this See the Lord Adonai, the Lord Yahweh, Almighty. And there's many other passages, but now you see it in Psalms 110, how now instead of one person, it's referring to God speaking to another someone as Lord Adonai, and which David calls Lord, but will also be the son of David. This is obviously Jesus, the sovereign Lord and the son of men. Amen. So girls, our Bibles, as we know, are translated to English languages, but the original common Greek language would use words that we would use in other terms, like the, like the Lord. We use it for describing God. But that back then, they would use it as a, as a person in a higher position than them, like their boss or even their fathers. In some cases, it was used for just to be respectful. They would say, excuse me, Lord, or addressing that person respectfully. So our language today had to put that word into something we would understand, like sir. So when you see it informed Lord with a lowercase l, it's not, it's not uh, informing that person as God. This is very important. Or either that someone that's saying in the Bible does not intend to speak about God. Some passages in the Bible, like uh, the woman at the well in John 4.11, the Samaritan woman, she calls Jesus, Sir, 
but in the Greek, she really saying Lord with the with the lower case L, which means in the Greek curious. And you see Rachel calling her father in Genesis 31 Lord, Sarah calling her husband Lord, the religious teachers calling Pontius Pilate Lord in Matthew 27 63. So the word curious with a little L for Lord simply means someone with authority, like how we call our landlord's Lord, or just being respectful. But the word curious is also used for Jesus, but with a capital L. I might sound a little bit confusing, but it's very important to notice the difference of these words. Curious was translated from Hebrew to Greek, and now from Greek to English as Lord. But again, this is very important to understand, the uppercase L, the lowercase L. But we know that the meaning for all of them is for God, Jesus, that he is supreme, sovereignty, master, he's the owner with absolute authority. And then, and you see this authority, girls, in the life of Jesus before he was even yet to be born. Luke 1.43, Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, this is what she says. Why am I so honored that the mother of the Lord should visit me? So not that she was honored just by Mary's attendance, but by the baby that Mary was carrying, whom Elizabeth was confessing as Lord. Though he was not even born yet, he was acknowledged as Lord. In verse 76 also you see Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, who was also filled with the Spirit, saying, right after his baby was born, John the baptism, that he, his child would prepare the way for this Lord. <laughs> so now in Luke 2.11 reads, Today in the town of David a Savior been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Now you see here the angels appear to these shepherds, telling them that this newborn infant, who is the son of David, is the Messiah, the Lord. This is amazing. Matthew 2.11 shows us three wise men worshiping Jesus as a small child. But look at this, also back in Luke chapter 2, how a man named Simeon, who the Holy Spirit was upon also, had a, a revelation from God that he would not pass away until he seen the Lord. And in verse 29, after seeing the child Jesus, he said, Sovereign Lord, just as you promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. You see all throughout the scriptures that Jesus, though he was a baby and a young child, he was Lord and prophesied as Lord, and worshipped as Lord. He was yet able to say he was Lord, so people could even confess him as, like this time, as a blasphemy, because he was called Lord by God to people, not by himself yet. And this is amazing. Even as a baby, Christ had authority. So now reading into John 1, we see John the Baptist also was to prepare the way for the Lord. Um, he says this, he is not worthy to untie Christ's straps to his sandals, meaning as he's not worthy even to be his slave to do so. Verse 29 says, seeing Jesus, he says, behold the Lamb of God, the one whom he has sent to prepare the way. Oh, I'm sorry. Behold the Lamb of God, the one whom he sent to prepare the way. Amen? Now, as Jesus began his ministry, you see how he's healing all kinds of sicknesses. You see, um, it's all kinds of sicknesses. And seeing all of those people, he went up on a mountain, and his disciples came to him and began, he began to teach them. Now this is the time at the Mount Sermon on the Mount. It began in Matthew, I think, in Matthew 5 to chapter 7. And when Jesus finished his teaching, the crowd were astonished. But why was they astonished? Verse 29 from chapter 7 answers it. By then, because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. They had never had someone teach with this authority how he had his own authority. He had his own authority interpreted the scriptures perfectly, unlike the scribes who, who took the authority of scriptures from other traditions and men. So as soon as he came down from the, the mountain, there was a man with leprosy saying, Jesus, Lord, acknowledge him as God. He saying, if you are willing to heal me now, if you're willing to heal me now, now, this is right after, guys, he heard Jesus teach him how to pray, saying, let your will be done. Because of his faith and relying on Jesus as Lord, he was healed. Also, the faith of the centurion, saying, Lord, and I love this, because you see how he acknowledged Jesus as Lord and asking him to heal his servant. Believing in the Savior and having so much faith that all Jesus had to do was just say a word. And this is great faith. But I love the part um, how he tells Jesus that you don't have to come under my roof. 
For I am also a man of authority, with servants, telling them what to do with my words. But you see now he acknowledges that Jesus' authority is greater than his. Jesus then looks at his disciples and marvels. And at that whole moment of Jesus' words, his servant was healed. <laughs> Mark chapter 2, you see how Jesus said to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes sitting there question in their heart, why is this? Why is he saying this? Who can forgive sins? And in their hearts they thought on him that he was blaspheming. But immediately he tells them, why are you thinking of it like this? Why are you so hostile? So both he heal, he's healing in forgiving sins. This is power only from God. And he goes on to say in verse 10, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Amen? But why didn't the scribes realize, if you guys know this, uh, why didn't you, that he knew what their hearts were thinking? And truly, this is only the Lord. All authorities don't know what they're thinking. Amen? So Tiffany shared last week that Jesus is God. In John 1, 1, we all know the scripture. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was always God and always had this authority. The same way the Father and the Holy Spirit who was always there. So Matthew 28, 18, uh, 28, 18, it reads this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. So the question is, why then is Jesus saying this, that it's been given to me if he always had it? Well, as we know, Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever, amen? And he does not change. So in Philippians 2, it shows us when he humbled himself by taking on, not giving up, you see that he did not, uh, he did not give up his deity, but that he put on flesh, becoming a man. Then now he is the God-man, the man that lived a perfect life and was obedient to the Father's will by dying and defeating death. God raised him, his humanity, and gave him all authority. To him, he placed him at his right hand. Amen? I hope you guys got that. That through his humanity, taking on the place and defeating sin, he has been given all authority. Amen? And we're going to talk about this in a little bit. But this was always the plan. John 3.35, the Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. All the Father has given to Christ, it was for him. Colossians 1.16 says it was for In him, all things are created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. This shows us how more... Jesus has authority, not just the second person as one after the Father, or one as under the authority, but the same authority equal to him. So now just as God being the potter who has all authority over the clay to do what he pleases with it, so does our Lord Jesus Christ. This is full authority. You can find this in Romans 9. And he is not just he just not he just not owns everything, but he also is the Lord that sustains everything. Sustaining means he is supporting everything. It's him that's keeping it going. And you could find this uh, in the start of Hebrews one uh, three. It says that the sun of the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his power, his powerful word. Colossians one seventeen says he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It is by him, all things are being held together. Amen? The earth is hanging up on nothing. Think about girls. You see this in Job 26.7. How he sustains the trees, the storms. Uh, you can find that in Psalm 135.6. How they all listen to his authority. The wind, the waters. Matthew 8.27 says the men were amazed. And asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and waves will be. There was a, amazed and astonished by by what he did in their understanding and his authority and how high and mighty he was. Uh, if you guys been with us though, uh, we've been, if you've been listening, we've been sharing the attributes of God and how the mountains, the stars, the sun, the moon, and the ground, even the animals all listen to, him, to his authority. You can even see this in Matthew 10, 29 reads, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them fall to the ground outside of your father's care. Even the birds, guys, that are no value to us, we don't acknowledge them, but God gives us an example how even these are in his control, under his authority, and he cares for them. So nothing is under, nothing is not under 
of his control. All things listen and follows his authority. Or else even the demon, Second Corinthians 12, was not a messenger of Satan, a uh, messenger of Satan, told to put a thorn in Paul's side. And who do you guys think told him to do that? It was a sovereign word. Even Satan, the enemy himself, you see it in Job, how God tells him what he can and can't do, that the Lord has authority over all principalities. Luke 10, 19, so Jesus says that through his authority, we can overcome the enemies. Amen? Uh, now it says that Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. This is in uh, Luke 6, 5. It says, the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. This implies that the Sabbath was for men, and he is God in the flesh. He made the Sabbath. The Pharisees twisted God's plan, making the Sabbath a burden for men when it was supposed to benefit them. Hebrews 4, 9 says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. He sets a new as people was disobeying, guys, and unbelieving, there is now coming a rest that is forever. You find this in Matthew 11:28, when Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So Christ is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. The old was a foreshadow of Jesus. Jesus says he is Lord over the Sabbath. Amen. So with that, uh, does he not also have authority over men? Yes, Proverbs 21, 1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of the water, he turn it whatsoever he will. The, this applies for every man with high authority on earth. Whether kings or presidents or mayors or popes, he has sovereign authority and he sustains these men. Even though these men are known for authority, that by his authority they are, because he is king of kings and lord of lords above every man. Ephesians 1, 21 uh, True 22 says, far above all rule authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. God has placed all things under his feet, appointing him to be the, whole, the to be head over everything for the church. Amen? So he is over all things in heaven and earth. Acts 17, 24. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. There is none greater than he. No other being guys carries this title. He is our master. John 13, 13, in the, in the King James Version, Jesus says, You call me master and Lord, and you say, and you say well, for so I am. Jesus says this is right. He is our master. So guys, here is the question. If he is our master, our lives literally do not belong to us. If we are Christians, Jesus Christ is our Lord, our Master, our owner. We are his possession. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 19 through 20, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not of your own, for you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 says, For what we preach is not ourselves, but of but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. Again, Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, when it says money, that's referring to the love of what it does, guys, to a person. The things it buys, the fame it brings, the pride it develops. So this is why it says in 1 John 2.15, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love the Father is not in them. These things are not to master us. And how do we know if they are? Jesus tells us, he says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus tells us to treasure the things that are in heaven, that are eternal. Amen? Ephesians 6.22-23 gives us an example. It reads, Wives, submit yourself to your own husband as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. So as a faithful wife grows, those who, those who not, do not disrespect their husbands but keep to one, her husband, her alone, we also as the church um, are supposed to be to him alone, whom we rely and who our hearts belong to. So if he is our master, what does this make us? Well, let's see. The Bible says in Romans 6, 18, reads, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves 
for righteousness. Slaves, girls, we are slaves to Christ. You see how we were always slaves to something, though. We were slaves to sin from nature. Christ redeemed us by faith and acknowledge him as Lord. So that's why the scripture says in Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Um, you will be saved from being slaves to sin that leads to death. Now we're slaves, as Paul says, that leads to righteousness. And verse 19 in chapter 6 says, it clearly shows how a born-again believer who is made righteous by being justified by faith alone, his righteousness will produce a uh, sanctified life, leading to holiness. The same way we were born into sin nature, we did all that our nature desired, producing sin after sin that was leading to eternal death. But a true born-again believer will not keep on sinning. Now hold on, you might say, that sounds like a life of working to be saved. We're always going to sin. And of course, First John tells us that if we say we are without sin, the fruit is not in us. We are sinners, of course. And no, we will never be perfect until the day that God glorifies us. I'm not talking about works. Even our goodest works we do, as Isaiah 64 says, are as filthy rags unto him. We are only saved by his glorious finished work that did not need us to do it. It was all Christ alone, our master. Uh, Titus 2.11 tells us that it teaches us to deny ungodliness. Girls, the same grace that saves us, it will, it will teach us. Like I'm saying now, Second Titus, uh, Titus 2.11, it teaches us to deny ungodliness. It's because a born again person is a new creation, has new desires, it craves for Christ. Yes, we still sin, but our hearts are made new. As Ezekiel 36.26 says, he removed the heart of stone that is dead with no life, giving us a heart of flesh that's active and alive, and their desires are not no more to sin. This is why Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Amen? John 3 says, Unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. The born again, the new creation. Now here's an example to what it is like. Let's just say a pig loves mud. It loves to play. It feels good to him. But the sheep does not like mud. So if that pig miraculously turns into a sheep, it will no longer love its old ways. It has become a different, a different creature. It has different desires. The same way is with us. Our sinful nature was loving. Um, our sinful nature was loving sin. Romans 6 says we was free from righteousness. We're free from it. But now being born again, we are not the same. We are born from above created to be conformed to the image of Christ. Even when we do sin, girls, we mourn over it. So now whatever we do is for Christ. Colossians 3, 17 says, and whatever you do, whatever in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. Amen? So I want to look back at Romans 10, 9. Notice how it says, confess, not make. If you acknowledge and confess him as Lord, many people love to use this slogan, make Jesus your Lord. No, Jesus is Lord over all, as it says in Philippians, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord over all. Whether you acknowledge it and worship him with your life or in that day heading towards eternal torment, he still is Lord over all. And all knees will bow, whether they like it or not. Amen? But just knowing that Jesus is Lord is not enough. Yes, I said that. As Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? For if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whatever we live or die, we are the Lord's. For through this Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord both over the dead and the alive, the living. Amen? Our confession of Jesus as Lord is not enough. People always say, all you have to do is just believe uh, and confess. Yes, but the scripture in Romans 10 says, if you confess Jesus as Lord, we don't want to take this part, or either no one's explaining it to people. What this is implying, we go on telling people that Jesus is just love, full of love, all love. And yes, there is no greater love than this, that he had to lay his perfect life for wretched sinners. But our God is also powerful and just and fair. Our God who is Lord. 
and through the words, through his words, things from nothing became. So he is to be acknowledged and respected, guys. Matthew 15, 8 says, these people honor me with their lips, but what he says, their hearts are far from me. Listen to this, girls. Jesus also says in, in uh, John 6, truly, truly, he says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now this was a spiritual example of union with Christ as of the vine and the branches, John 15, like being part of Christ, not just wanting something from him as these people did in this context of John 6, which is superficial faith. Jesus says in John 2, 23 through 25, now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing, believing in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all that he did, all that they did. Uh, he did not trust himself to them about them, man, for he knew about mankind. He knew what was in each person. This explains himself how even though they claimed to, be, to believe in him, Jesus had no trust in them, because he knows what's in man's hearts. He was looking for those who are with new hearts that seek him, that are willing to lose. Luke 9, 23 says, Then he said to the crowd, If any of you want to, to follow, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross daily and follow me. When we confess Christ as our Lord and Savior and believe in him, if we are willing to let him take over our fleshly habits away and willing to be raised to him, Are we still captive, or are we still captives to our sinful ways, desiring it more than him? People in the Bible and in the early church girls was martyred, and still today in other countries, people suffering for his name. But with our modern Christianity that tells us to live this life to our best desires, to have it all, and then at that day when we were a little bit down and were a little bit mad at God because we, we don't want to give up simple little things. Now, so now let's just say, like, we have to suffer. As the Bible says, that there will be many trials and persecutions for the born again. All the more people like this will walk away. Just as those who was, just, just as those who was in John 6. But there's people, guys, that are giving their lives away because they don't even want to deny his lordship. Just not to deny him as lord, they're giving up their lives. So superficial also applies to those who just want a ticket out of hell and say, uh, I'd rather go to heaven than hell with no understanding about eternal life in heaven. Some think it's boring heaven and just don't want to burn in hell. This is no acknowledgement of our true Lord and what he has to offer. Also Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, uh, everybody knows the scripture says, um, uh, everyone who calls me, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, uh, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I will tell them, look how scary, plainly, I never knew you, my frightening words, away from you, evildoers. So they did not acknowledge him as Lord. They did acknowledge him as Lord, but no realness to him, relying on themselves. He never knew them. Yes, these people, although acknowledge him, he was Lord. They relied on their own works, which we should never do. I don't want anyone, anyone to think that through our filthy works we can be saved. No, it's Christ alone. But it's not just for the works, based girls. Go to Matthew 25, the parable of the ten bridesmaids. There was five wise and five foolish. Uh, the foolish was not waiting, they was not ready, and when that day came, they also said, Lord, Lord. He also said, I never knew you. And this gives an example in Luke 12, 36. He says, like a servant waiting for their master, uh, waiting to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they, they can open immediately the door for him. Now girls, being ready means to be preparing for whatever arises in our lives. 
is to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, our Lord, at all times while we are eagerly awaiting him. This is what it means to wait on him and to be ready for his coming. Amen? And just to take note, girls, just one of us example is like, Maybe you're uh, examining yourself, which is a good thing. The Bible tells us to, to examine ourselves and you're thinking, maybe I, maybe I do fall under these superficial Christians, or maybe I do rely on my works, or maybe, uh, maybe I don't take them seriously, or maybe I don't really know him and I, I feel discouraged. Well, we know what it says in Matthew 7, where it says, ask, seek, knock. The girls, we have to ask the Lord, we have to seek the Lord, we have to keep on knocking. He wants us to he wants us to acknowledge that we need him and that he is the only way. And if we continue to knock, he will answer. He will he will come into our lives. He will uh, open those doors. Amen. Isaiah 55 says, "Come, come freely, all who thirst." He gives this invitation, but for those who thirst for him, not for thirst for superficial things and for things of the world and for selfish desires. If you thirst him, come to him. Amen. So I just wanted to get that out there, but I'm, that's, uh, and I just want to say, if you continue to pray, seek big God to hear you, to give you a new desire. Amen? Uh, let's go back to the, to the, the teaching. Philippians 2.12, therefore, my friends, uh, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed me, not only in your presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul was telling them, just as I have taught you and you have obeyed in my presence, now in my absence, work out, continue to obey, read, follow, worship, and do it with fear. Meaning, take it seriously, fear, take it seriously. Verse 13, look what it says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Amen? It is God that gives us the strength and will to do, enabling us. He is enabling us. This is why Corinthians 12, 3 says that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Not like these people that Jesus gave us examples of that Jesus said, I never knew you. There was, um, that I never knew you. Their confession, girls, was not professions. It was not real confession. They truly didn't acknowledge him as Lord. So Jesus is Lord over, even over our salvation. And Jonah 2.9 says this. You see it also in Romans 8.29. Those who he justified, uh, he also glorified. If you go further in the verses 32, he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also along with him graciously give us all things. If he sends his son to die for us, he will also provide sanctification to us, drawing sin slowly from us. And this is all his doing, Psalms 106, 8 says, for his name's sake, that he might take his mighty power to be known. Amen. Jesus is Lord over all things. Let his name be praised, and know he is almighty, just all knowing. Lord, and he is also a good Lord. For the believer, he surrounds them with goodness. But for the unbeliever, this is not good news. As Paul Washer says, one of my favorite uh, preachers, says, a good God is terrifying news. Why? Because no one is good, guys. No one is good. And all those who don't believe in Jesus as Lord and trust in him will be punished by a good Lord that hates bad. Just as a good judge who judges good, so is our just good God. But the believers, we have this joy in his goodness. As Psalms 135, 7 says, they celebrate your abundant goodness and joyful sing of your righteousness. Psalms 31, 19 says, how abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestowed in the sight of all, or those, those who take refuge in you. One of my favorite scriptures is Psalms 34, 8. Uh, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. If we, if we acknowledge that, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Second Peter 1, 3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his glorious goodness. He called us by his glorious goodness, Scott Rose. Romans 8, 
28 says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Amen. And of course, girls, the good news. Philippians 2, 6, 8 says, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider himself equally with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in the human likeness, and being found in the appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Guys, this is the good news, that Jesus, the Lord, who was always God, came as one of us to suffer, to save us, to save us and die and take the penalty of our sins that was eternal that we don't really take this to heart guys it's not just a good guy like that came and saved us from a bullet whom yes we probably would have think we would be thankful for him to our lives no but it was jesus a perfect god in perfect union with his father that he came and took the father's wrath and you have to imagine eternal wrath from an almighty god there's no words to describe how frightening this is but we deserved it this was a holy God. We deserved it too, a holy God. But he came and lived a perfect life to be a sacrifice for us. And for that, verse 11, uh, nine, verse 9 through 11, Philippians 2, it says, Therefore God has exalted him to be the highest place and gives him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and every and earth. And, and under it, I'm sorry, and every tongue shall acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. That is the name that he gave above all names. It's not, see, many of us will think it's Jesus, but I, and I love how R.C. Spill says it, that it's Lord. This is the name that he gave um, that is above every name, Lord. So, so to God be the glory, uh, the Father, glory to God. So we see that Jesus is Lord over the earth the heavens and Lord over the things in the earth, Lord over life and death, Lord over angels, Lord over demons, Lord over the commandments, Lord over men, Lord over our salvation. Jesus is Lord over all. <laughs> and the finish is Psalms 156. It says, let everything that has bread praise the Lord. Again it says, praise the Lord. So, God bless you guys. There's so much more about his lordship and that he is lord. And there's so much stories about his life. And uh, this is just not even a scratch of it, guys. There's so much more. And I encourage everybody to continue learning that he's lord and how, how it's so serious that we have to acknowledge him, that he's not just this gullible God. He is an almighty God. Yes, he's loving. Yes, he's caring. He's goodness but he's just and he's almighty and he has all wisdom and knowledge. He's not a fool. And we've got to take this to heart. Our God is not a fool. He's the wisest thing ever. On his mind was everything before creation. He is Lord over time, guys. Things we can't even figure out, he's Lord over it. So we're to take him serious and we're to worship him with reverence and fear and love. Not as a monster, but as a respectful father who deserves all glory because he is Lord. Amen. So God bless you girls. I'm going to pray. And uh, I guess that's it. So thank you, Lord, for this night, Father God. Deva, forgive me if I said anything wrong, Father God. But I just want to show, Deva, to the world that you are Lord. You are Lord over Lord. You are King over kings. There is no one above you, Father God. Please, Lord, help us. Forgive us for the things we say. We might even pray to you wrong. But, Lord, you know all things, Father God. You know our hearts, Deva. You know our motives. And we ask you to change it, Deva, that we will grow in this respect for you, that we will live our lives for you, Deva, to please you, Deva. And we know that you say to love the brother just like you humbled yourself. We ask you that we can humble ourselves too, Deva. Because, Deva, you said, uh, how could we show we love, Deva, if we do for the brother, if we be obey you? Help us, Father God. Help us lead us into this life, Deva. We know that you are Lord over our life, Deva. And we thank you for everything. We thank you for this message. We thank you for this night. Deva, have your way, Father, for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, which is above all names, Lord, sovereign Lord. Amen.